pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, please have a seat. I don't know what your favorite toy was growing up, um, but I was really into Lego. I love playing Lego. And uh, one of the joys of, of fatherhood is being allowed to play Lego again. You know, I, I don't think it's really allowed otherwise, is it? You have to do it secretly as an adult. But I, I love on a Saturday morning often, you know, just getting the Lego out all over the floor. I pretend that I'm helping the kids and secretly I'm just there kind of, you know, like my 11-year-old self all over again. And if you're familiar with Lego, you know, it, it comes, you know, in, in a box like this, okay? You know, something like this, doesn't it? And the, it costs a ridiculous amount of money. So, you know, if you want to begin Lego, you've got to start by kind of shelling out, or if you can, you get the grandparents to, to cough up, you know, for, for a box a bit like this. And when you get home, you know, you, you open the box up, and what do you get? You get a kind of plastic bag, don't you, full of little bits of Lego. And you, you open that up, and you put it all over the floor, and you've, you've just got a mess, haven't you, at the beginning? A very expensive mess, but just a mess, just bricks everywhere. You know, they don't seem to make sense. It's kind of just a disarray on the floor. Well, even if you're not familiar with, with Lego, when you look at it, you know, you, you know that's not what it's meant to be. You know, it, it's not in all its fullness yet. It, it's kind of in need of something, isn't it? It's in need of someone coming along and spending some time gathering up all those bits and building them into something, into what they're designed to be. And we've been looking at the book of Ephesians, at God's building project. And the book of Ephesians says, actually, our world is very much like that pile of Lego on the floor. It's a mess. You know, it's divided. Disarray. It's broken. You know, Ephesians 2, when we were there, said, actually, by nature, we're dead, enslaved, condemned. You know, as we, as, as we look around at the world around us, I think all of us will probably agree there's a sense this is not as it ought to be. And our world also needs someone to come along, doesn't it, and build it up into something. And Ephesians says very clearly, the person God has chosen to do that is Jesus. And if you like, the book of Ephesians is a bit like the instruction booklet that you get in these boxes of Lego. You know, Paul reveals and tells us God's plan. What is God doing in Jesus? Well, he's bringing life, isn't he, to the spiritually dead. You know, we're connected with God again through his death and resurrection. He's bringing us together. Where we were just a kind of scattered bunch of people, he's bringing us together, isn't he? We looked at how through the cross we have peace with one another. And actually, Ephesians says he's building us into a new humanity. You know, through Jesus, God is building us into what we were always designed to be. Now, we're at the kind of transition point in Ephesians. But before Paul moves on, he prays in what we've already seen. So this morning, we come to the second prayer in the letter. Do you remember there was a prayer at the end of chapter 1? You know, there was that kind of waterfall of all the spiritual blessings in Christ. And then Paul prayed that that truth would be applied to their lives, that they'd know more of God personally. And a similar thing happens now. We've just seen God's remarkable plan, you know, what he's doing in Christ. And then Paul prays that that truth would be applied to their hearts personally, that they'd know more of God's love. So let's read. Um, This is Ephesians 3, so if you've got a Bible, um, you can pull that out and look it up. I think the words will come up on the screen. Ephesians 3, starting at verse 14. For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Now I think sometimes when we hear about God's love for us, when we hear about all God has done for us in Christ, you know, it's a bit like kind of 
the, the, the water in this jug. You know, we, we hear about it and we speak about it, but it's kind of something over there that we're looking at, something outside of us. So we, we know about it, we're grateful for it, we know it's true, it's life-giving, it's bountiful, but actually it doesn't really impact our lives as it should. And in, in one sense, what Paul is praying for is this. He's praying that in Christ, the fullness of God's love would flood our hearts, that, that all God has done for us in Christ would touch down in our lives. You know, in that sense, it would go from something out there that we marvel at to something in here that transforms us. So he's, it's a prayer for God's love in our hearts. And the first thing Paul longs for them, Paul longs for us, is that we be rooted in God's love as our foundation. And the point here is that God's love comes first. We've seen this, haven't we, in the structure of Ephesians. There's two clear halves to Ephesians. The first three chapters are all about what God has done in Christ. The last three chapters are all about what it looks like for us to live in response to that. The kind of hinge, if you like, in the book is just coming up, chapter 4, verse 1, which will come up on the screen, where Paul says, as a prisoner for the Lord then, and listen to this bit, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. You see the hinge? So it talks, you know, three chapters of, of what God has done and then three chapters of how we can live a life in response to that. Now, is that arbitrary? You know, is this just a kind of structure Paul is using? Could he have switched it over? Well, no. There's a, there's a profound theological point in that order. God's love for us comes first. Anything we might do for God is in response to that. What God has done comes first. What we do flows out of that. And actually, when people distort or misunderstand the Christian faith, so often it's because we get those two things the wrong way around. So if you ask lots of people in our society, you know, colleagues at work, maybe family members, people who live around you, what is Christianity all about? Lots of people would have the sense that it's about learning to be a good person. You know, learning to live good lives so that God will be pleased with us. So they imagine if they were coming to church, you know, there'd be someone like me at the front, and, they'd be, and I'd be speaking all about what we ought to do, what we ought not to do, how we ought to behave, how we ought to live. You know, you see this, don't you? Because people who have no real interest in church, when they have children, suddenly they get interested. And they send their children to church because they want their children to learn how to be good. And it's an understandable misconception because actually that's how most human religion works. I've been struck recently by how this works itself out in Islam. Uh, one of my Muslim friends on WhatsApp, he's very unwell at the moment. And, and suddenly, you know, normally he, he, he doesn't post anything on his status. Suddenly his status is full of Quranic quotations. And we've got friends who, who are serving in a Muslim context overseas. And they've, their neighbor, they said it's the same thing. That he, they're very unwell and all of a sudden, they've really kind of buttoned down into their religion. The hope being that if we do the right things, if we're really zealous, well, then God will be pleased. And he'll heal me. He'll bless me. But we will only truly grasp the Christian faith when we realize it's the other way around. God's love comes first. Actually, baptism shows that, doesn't it? You know, just think for a moment. This is a little bit cheeky. But just think, if we were to design this ceremony... What do you think it would look like? Well, think about the bits that we've added into the ceremony. We give people a certificate. We ask them to talk about their story. You know, I think if it was down to us, suddenly baptism will be about what the individual has done. But what is baptism all about? The sign that the Lord God has given us. It's about what Jesus has done, isn't it? it sh the baptism shouts out of Jesus' death and resurrection. Those that are baptized have simply received that and identified with him. So God's love comes first, and actually this is something as Christians we need to remember. It seems simple, but so often we drift away from it, don't we? I'll, uh, I'll always remember um, the conversation I had with Alice's father when I asked uh, for her hand in marriage. It's one of those conversations you don't really forget. Um, and it was, it was quite you know, surreal. It was all very covert. We, kind of, uh, we met at a pub next to a railway station. I was on a journey somewhere. Um, and uh, we had this conversation, and actually he sh what he, s he shared was really wise. 
You know, he, the, the words he shared were really helpful. And he, he told me a bit about Alice. And he said, actually, Alice growing up, there were kind of two sides to Alice. You know, at school, she was very bold. You know, she would always put herself forward for, for things. She was happy to take risks. You know, she was willing to kind of go through difficult things. But he said, actually, also, she was the girl growing up who would cry at the school gates because she didn't want to leave her parents. And he said, the thing that's enabled her to take risks and to be bold is the security of her family. It is the love that she's enjoyed in her family. You know, it wasn't that, uh, you know, achieving at school earned her parents' love. It was the other way around, wasn't it? She felt able at school to push herself because of the security she had at home. And I think what Paul is longing for us is something very similar. That, that what we do for the Lord would flow out of the security of his love for us. So look at verse 17, the second half of verse 17. Paul says, I pray that you, being rooted and established in love. And I think that's talking about rooted and established in God's love for us. So established is the idea of a building, isn't it? You know, the, everything is built on the foundations. Now if we could have the next picture up. So, you know, what Paul's saying here is the foundation is God's love. And everything we build in terms of the Christian life, our service... You know, our holiness, our behavior, everything we build is on the foundation of God's love. Rooted, you know, is the, is the image of a tree, isn't it? You know, so we go to the next picture. Do you see again what Paul's saying? You know, the, what are we rooted in as Christians when things are healthy? We're rooted in God's love, aren't we? And everything grows up out of that. And, and what do the roots provide for a tree? Well, they provide security, don't they? The roots allow the tree to grow large. The roots allow the tree to withstand storms. But also the roots provide resources, don't they? If, if, if they're rooted into good soil, moist soil, actually there's a never-ending supply of nutrients and water you know, coming into the tree, giving it life. And the fruit grows out of that, doesn't it? And Paul's saying it's exactly the same for us as Christians. You know, the fruit, and we're going to look at these three things in the, in the second half of Ephesians. At our service, how we serve one another. At our holiness, how we live godly lives. At, sp at our fight, you know, spiritual warfare. All of that, do you see, flows out from the roots in God's love. And actually, so often, the problems we get in the Christian life are because we've got this upside down. So if you've got uh, the next slide. Some of you will know this uh, phrase, this English phrase, of putting the cart before the horse. Okay, it's the wrong way around, isn't it? You know, it's not going to work. A and so often that happens in the Christian life. We put our focus first on, our fruit, on the fruit, on our behavior, on our service. And we kind of think that will somehow lead us into God's love. So if you can have the next slide. You know, effectively, this is what we end up doing. And you can see it's wrong, isn't it? It is the wrong way around. You know, we, we, we put our focus on the Christian life looking for God's love to come in the future. So let, you know, just um, let me kind of draw this out a little bit with an example so over the next few weeks, as we get into the second half of Ephesians, we're going to be looking at service, how we're called to serve one another in Ephesians 4, about godliness, you know, how we live godly lives in our speech, in our relationships, and we're going to look at spiritual warfare, how we're called to stand and fight. You know, all that is a focus on, on what we're called to do, isn't it, in response. But it's so important as we go into that, that we remember all we've just seen, and that we hear all that, coming out of the roots and the foundation of God's love for us. So let me just give an example of, of the difference this makes. Let, me, let us think about service. Okay, so, you know, we're called, aren't we, to serve one another. And serving is costly, isn't it? Because loving one another is always costly. It always costs us something when we give out. And often we, will, we end up serving from our own resources, and that's certainly my experience. So we give out. We, someone comes to us and they've got a need. So we step in and we serve. And effectively we serve, if, if we, this is full of our resources, by puncturing the cup. Okay? And a little bit of water comes out. And then there's another need and we puncture the cup again. And a little bit of water comes out. We're serving out of our own resources. I figured there was already enough water around today. <laughs> okay? You know, another need comes up and we puncture the cup. And all the time, what's happening? The level's going down, isn't it? The level's going down as the water leaks out. And where does that leave us in the end? 
Well, it leaves us drained and broken, bitter maybe, dry. But you see, there's another picture of service. And it's a picture of God's love in us overflowing. So we, we are so full of God's love, so rooted and established in that, that actually we give to others out of the overflow. You see the difference? You know, actually we are so full of God's love that it overflows to those around us. Well, that's a very different picture, isn't it? We're no longer left drained and broken and bitter and dry. And I think this, that's what Paul's... So do you see, when we come into that section on service, it's an overflow of God's love for us. And isn't that what we long for as a church? That everything we do would flow out of God's love for us. That our hearts would be so full of God's love, it would overflow to bless those around us. So God's love comes first. We, you know, Paul longs that we are rooted in God's love as our foundation. He longs, secondly, that we would grasp God's love in all its fullness. So look at verse 18. I pray that you, that you may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Paul longs for them to grasp the magnitude of God's love for them. And I think this isn't just talking about grasping it intellectually, but in experience too. So I, I don't know if this illustration will help, but you know, I'll give it a go and see. You know, the, so the trousers I'm in today, you know, they're my Sunday trousers. I don't really wear them during the rest of the week. You know, so I, I, kind of, I know they're there on the shelf. They belong to me. But to be honest, for the rest of the week, they don't really make much impact in my life. And maybe for some of us, God's love for us in Christ is a bit like that. We know it's there, you know, we know he loves us, but effectively it's kind of on a shelf in the cupboard somewhere. It doesn't really make an impact to our lives day by day. Maybe on Sunday as we gather, as we hear a bit more, you know, it has an impact in our identity, in our actions. Well, most of the week, okay, I spend the week in jeans. They're my kind of day in, day out trousers. And if you like, Paul is saying he longs for God's love to be our jeans. You know, it's what we live in day, day by day. It's what we walk in. It's what we're clothed in all the time. He wants us to grasp how wide the love of Christ is. Wide enough to encompass anyone. You know, we've seen that with Jew and Gentile, haven't we, in Ephesians. But look at the Gospels. Look at the people that Jesus welcomes in. Tax collectors like Matthew and Zacchaeus. Lepers. Prostitutes. The thief next to him on the cross. Peter, who betrayed him. Paul, who persecuted and killed Christians. No one is outside Christ's reach. You know, there's always people, when, when they hear from the Bible, when they're in church, you think, look, I'm not the right type. You know, I, I, you don't know me and my background. I'm not a churchy person. The love of Christ is wide enough for you. He, he wants us to grasp how long the love of Christ is. You know, when we think about who loves us, who often comes to mind? I think often it's old friends, isn't it? Family. Why is that? I think often it's because they've travelled with us for longer. They've shown their commitment over time. Their love has lasted. Well, think for a moment about the length of Christ's love. Do you remember what Ephesians 1.5 told us? Long before any of our friends knew us, long before we even knew ourselves, long before any twinkle in our parents' eyes, in fact, before this physical world existed, in love, God predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ. And what is more, the love of Christ will continue into eternity. He promises in Romans 8, not even death can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. See, in Christ, God has always loved us and he always will love us. He's not going to give up on you. He's not going to walk out. And he wants us to grasp how high the love of Christ is. You know, I think so often when we think about God's love, our initial focus is his kindness to us on this earth, his provision, his guidance, his help. And obviously the love of God impacts this material world, doesn't it? But if we stop there, it'd be like standing in front of a skyscraper 
and focusing the whole time just on the entrance lobby. You know, not realizing that there were a hundred floors towering over us. What has Ephesians told us? The love of Christ is high enough to raise us up with him. We've received every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. We are already seated in the heavenly realms with him. Our identity is already there. We have access to God's throne room. You were talking, weren't we, about already having a seat there with our name on it, as it were. He wants us to grasp how deep the love of Christ is. You know, God's love for us will never run out. We're never going to use it up. How do we know that? You know, how do we know the true depth of Christ's love? Well, look at the cross. For while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That is the cost, the depth of his love. He's given everything for you. Endured excruciating physical pain. Given up his reputation, his own life, his relationship with the Father even. Alice was, um, made a comment to me the other day which really stuck home. She, you know, she was just talking about how difficult it's been not being able to see her parents during this time because of the COVID restrictions. But then reflecting on how actually Jesus gave up his relationship with his father. You know, not, not just because of some kind of government advice, but because he willingly faced the wrath of the father, the anger of the father. That's how much... He loves us. That's the depth of his love. And it's while we were still sinners, so he knows all the muck. (laughs) There's nothing that's going to surprise him. Do you see how deep the love of Christ is? We're not going to use it up, are we? You know, when that accusation comes from the evil one, oh, you've done it now. You've gone too far. Remember how deep the love of Christ is. We'll never get to the bottom of it. Now, as I, I speak about the love of God, it might be some are thinking this morning, look, To be honest, Matthew, it doesn't feel like God loves me at the moment. You know, we get an email from my employer that tells me I'm being made redundant. When I have to cancel yet another holiday. When my prayers for healing go unanswered for another week. When this depression refuses to lift, it doesn't feel like God loves me. Well, we've got a deal, haven't we, with this common assumption That experiencing God's love in Christ means experiencing material blessing or favourable circumstances. And I think, you know, we know in a sense that assumption doesn't hold up. You know, think of Jesus. Twice God broke open the heavens to declare, this is my son whom I love. But he faced rejection, didn't he? Opposition, betrayal, exhaustion, suffering. Or think of Paul who's writing these words. He's writing them from prison in Rome. Think maybe of the relationship between a parent and a child. You know, when I was growing up, there was all kinds of stuff that I wanted. Alice actually managed to find my Christmas list from 1999. I won't read the whole thing out because it kind of condemns me a little bit. But, (laughs) you know, there's all kinds of stuff that I wanted. And um, number four on this list is designer clothes. Or as I've spelt it in those days, designer cloths. And I'm pretty sure, I can't quite remember 1999, but I'm pretty sure I didn't get those, you know, remembering the wardrobe that I had. You know, often there was stuff that I wanted that my parents didn't give me. I remember yo-yos going around the school. I so wanted a yo-yo. Thought that was all life was about, but they didn't give me a yo-yo. Or Pokemon cards. Now, was I right to conclude that my parents didn't love me as much as my friends' parents? No. No. Actually, in their love, they were teaching me to value things that are more significant than possessions. Again, growing up, I usually wanted to play all the time. If my parents had given me the choice, watch TV or do my homework, it would have been watch TV every single time. Again, was I right to conclude that my parents didn't love me because they turned the TV off and forced me to get on with my revision? No. You know, playing all the time is fine in childhood, isn't it? But childhood is temporary. And actually, in their love, they were preparing me for the world to come. Well, so it is with our Heavenly Father. Difficult circumstances doesn't mean he doesn't love us. Maybe in his love, he is teaching us to value things that are more important than holidays or health 
or happiness. Maybe in his love, he's preparing us for the world to come. Actually, this world is temporary, isn't it? And thankfully, God's work in our lives is focused on the one that's going to last. You see, actually, God, do you see how God's love is not a static love in our life? It's a love that has purposes for us, a love that transforms us. And that gives us hope, doesn't it? You know, many of us will bear the wounds and the scars from where we've not been loved in the past. Maybe we face rejection or cruelty or abandonment. And actually, we're still riddled with those insecurities. We're like parched earth in that sense, cracked and dry and rough. And we wonder if that can ever change. Well, the love of Christ is able to change us. As we open our lives to him, it's like a downpour, able to fill the cracks and soften the ground and heal the wounds. You see, God loves us too much to leave us as we are. Actually, as he pours his love into our hearts by his spirit, it will have an impact. Remember again, this Lego box. You know, what is the picture on the front of God's box? What is he building us into? Well, it's Jesus, isn't it? He's the one into whose image we're being conformed. All of us, by God's spirit, are being made more like him. And, you know, I think when these verses talk about being filled to the measure of all the fullness of God, it's talking about this. That God is going to keep working in us until we're the people we were created to be. Until the image of God is fully restored in us. So, you know, how do we grasp the fullness of God's love in Christ? How, how do we keep the cup full, as it were? Well, we come to him, don't we? Spend time with him. God is willing. You know, he, he delights by his spirit. To, 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 it's, it's part of his grace, isn't it? His gift to us, that we might know and enjoy his love. But we need to come to him. Spend time with him. I think a big way is to listen to him. You know, the, the voices that we listen to have a huge impact, don't we? I think that's particularly true at the moment. I've noticed that in my own life. If actually the voice that we're hearing day in, day out, moment by moment, in every spare minute, is the BBC, what impact is that going to have on our life at the moment? Fear, isn't it? Anxiety, despair. Or, or if that voice is social media, again, you know, that's always where we go. That's the voice that's loudest in our ears. What impact is that going to have in our lives? Well, often it, it tells us that we're unworthy, that we're missing out, that we're inadequate. The voice that you and I need to hear is God's voice to us through his word that reminds us of his love, that tells us of Christ, you know, that shows us the full extent of his love for us. But ultimately, as we finish, you know, this isn't something we do. This is God's work in us yet again. So, so the last thing that, that Paul reminds us of is that we rely on the power of God's spirit. You know, look at verse 16. I pray that out of his, out of God's glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. You know, how, how does God's love change from something out there, water in the jug, if you like, to something in here, water in the cup? Well, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. He is the one that joins us to Christ. He is the one that applies the work of Christ to the heart of the believer. And I think that means, just like Paul, the best place for us to start is in prayer. You know, maybe today, as we have the final song, or, or later this afternoon, ask God to root you in God's love. Ask God by his Spirit to help you grasp the fullness of Christ's love. Ask God to pour his love into your heart by his Spirit. He gladly gives to those who ask him. You know, as, as a pastor, I, I often ask people, you know, how they're doing with the Lord, how they're doing spiritually. And lots of, you know, people often say, look, they're doing fine. Life's going all right. They're doing fine spiritually, materially. And to be honest, it's quite hard to read a lot into that. But when someone is circumstantially hard up, but doing well in the Lord, you know, learning from him, growing in him, aware of his goodness, listening to his voice. Well, that thrills me. Because that is evidence, isn't it, of the Spirit of God at work. I think that's one of the reasons that we'll miss Bob and Marilyn so much as a church. You know, those of us who know them know that life has not been easy for them. And yet every time you speak to them, they speak of God's goodness, don't they? And his faithfulness. And his work in their lives and how his word is having an impact day by day. 
One of the books that's had an impact on me over the years is Richard Vermbrand's story called Tortured for Christ. He was a, a pastor in Romania. He was arrested by the secret police in the, the 1950s for, for standing up to the communists. And he was in prison for 14 years and treated awfully. You know, there were solitary confinements and brainwashing and brutal physical torture. And um, when he's, he, he speaks a little bit about um, a young girl who was in prison. She'd been spreading the gospel, uh, teaching children about Christ. And to make her arrest as painful as possible, they waited until the day she was due to get married. And on her wedding day, the door suddenly burst open and the secret police rushed in. She was roughly handcuffed. And as she was led away, she said these words, I thank my heavenly bridegroom for this jewel he has presented to me on my marriage day. I thank him that I am worthy to suffer for him. And listen to what he says uh, about the brainwashing. He says, we, we had to sit for 17 hours a day, for weeks, months, and years, hearing communism is good, communism is good, communism is good, Christianity is stupid, Christianity is stupid, Christianity is stupid, give up, give up, give up. Several Christians have asked me how we could resist brainwashing. There is only one method of resistance to brainwashing. It is heart washing. If the heart is cleansed by the love of Jesus Christ, and if the heart loves him, one can resist all tortures. What would a loving bride not do for a loving bridegroom? What would a loving mother not do for her child? God, if you love Christ as Mary did, who had Christ as a baby in her arms, if you love Jesus as a bride loves her bridegroom, then you can resist such tortures. The Christians who suffered for their faith in prison could love. I'm a witness that they could love God and humanity. It's remarkable, isn't it? Their circumstances were terrible, and yet their love overflowed. How is that possible? Because the love of God was in their hearts. That The courage of those Christians came out of the security of God's love for them. A love so wide, so long, so high, and so deep, that even under those conditions, it overflowed to those around them. Now, we might say, look, I could never do that. Actually, yes, you could. Not because of who you are, not because of some inner strength or resolve, but because of God's power at work in you. Listen to how Paul finishes his prayer in verses 21, 20 and 21. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever, amen. That's our hope, isn't it? Our hope is in our God, whose mighty power is at work within us. So isn't this our longing, you know, as a church, that we'd be rooted in God's love, that we would grasp the fullness of God's love for us in Christ? You know, I hope we've been excited as we've looked through these first three chapters of Ephesians. Because actually what's to come now is Paul's going to lay out how we can live a life worthy of this incredible calling that we've received. Um, but let's uh, just sit before Tony comes back up and uh, I'll lead us in prayer. We pray in these words from Ephesians 3. Lord, we, we kneel before you, the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. And we pray that out of your glorious riches, you might strengthen us with power through your spirit in our inner being, so that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith. And we pray that we, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all your holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that we may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to you, who are able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. To you be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen.